Good morning, everyone. It's so wonderful to be here in Coimbatore. I'm here today to talk about your health. Can I have a quick show of hands? How many of you have ever taken antibiotics in your life? Is there anybody who hasn't taken antibiotics in their life? Yeah. This is it, right? It's 100% of us have taken a course of antibiotics at some point or the other. So once upon a time, there was a depressed king who spent all his time inside his palace. Then one day he met a happy potter who spent all his time playing in the mud. The story of bacteria can seem like a fairy tale, but what I'm going to tell you in the next 15 minutes is all true. When I was 16 years old, I moved to Seattle to study. In Seattle, there was one issue. It had the highest rates of depression and suicide in the US, and nobody could understand why. There was a term for it, seasonal affective disorder. And I remember thinking that, wow, you know, is it just because you know, things are gloomy during uh, eight months of the year, and uh, uh, people don't go outside, and there is no sunshine, and you get depressed and gloomy, and, you know, and, 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 and uh, that can lead to thoughts of suicide. But somehow, that really didn't sit well with me, that explanation. There had to be something more, because as I was reading, some other bits of information came to the fore. The first thing was that, you know, people who work on submarines for six months at a time, they also get depressed because they don't see the sunshine. And people who watch too much TV or are playing video games, they also get depressed. But if you actually look at some other categories, uh, people who work in Antarctic uh, station, you know, in Antarctica, they only work in the summer, and in summer it's 24-7 sunshine. Six months of the year, it's, you know, the, the sun doesn't set. Those people also get depressed. Why? Coal miners who spend majority of their time underground don't have higher rates of depression than normal people. So there's something else going on that is not related to just lack of sunshine. You know, and, and, and we had no way of finding out. And certainly, you know, 25 years ago, I had no idea what that could be. But it was something that was in the back of my mind. And I had an aha moment a few years ago when uh, scientists found literally a miraculous bacteria called Mycobacterium vaccae that lives only in the soil, in dead matter, in organic matter. It doesn't, it, it doesn't actually live on our bodies. But when it comes into contact with our bodies, it stimulates the release of serotonin in the brain. And serotonin is a mood regulator. So it turns out that humans evolved to be outside, out in the mud, playing in the sand in the soil. And a significant component of our happiness and our happy mood is related to uh, being outside. So seasonal affective disorder is not really related to the sun. It turns out it's related to the lack of soil bacteria on our bodies. So we have to go outside. We have to do gardening. You know, people who are doing pottery are actually very happy people. So this is something for you all to think about when uh, you, know, you look at your own families and you see that people who get a little bit more depressed than others. And here's a very easy solution. So it turns out that you know, in, in this case, happiness is actually quite free because you, all you have to do is just step outside, or preferably in your bare feet. Now, I had another issue. When I was 22 years old, I had just moved to London. And I used to get a lot of bacterial skin infections, boils. And I had no idea why. I went to the doctor and I got prescribed antibiotics. And uh, it would solve the problem for about six months. And then I would get recurring uh, 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 boils again. Then the antibiotics made me develop acid reflux. How many of you have had acid reflux? Can I see a quick show of hands? Uh, and, and this is quite common, uh, yeah, especially in India. And of course, when I went to see the doctor about my acid reflux, they put me on something called a proton pump inhibitor, uh, which is a pill that you take every day that lowers the level of stomach acid. Now, the problem with that is that stomach acid is used, uh, is, is, is really needed by your body because in order to absorb the minerals and the vitamins and, and, the, uh, and the nutrition from food, you need acid. So you then end up with absorption issues, you end up with all kinds of other issues. So I was 22 years old, a bit overweight, with acid reflux, recurring bacterial infections, and I was thinking, you know, this, there's something wrong. You know, why am I unhealthy? You know, I should be at the peak of health in my 20s. 
And of course, a daily uh, proton pump inhibitor, you know, I say the pharmaceutical companies smile because, you know, they, that's what they want you to do. They want you to get rid of all natural uh, cures. They want you to take pills every single day and pay them an uh, annuity. And it's, it's not that they're bad people, it's just that that's how they make money. So I decided to spend some time researching for a cure myself because it just seemed illogical that I should be on daily medication for the rest of my life at the age of 22. So I went to the British Library uh, because at that time there was no Google. And uh, you know, you see the picture of the British Library, those computers were not there then. Uh, so you had to literally go through the, the old, uh, you know, the archives just looking and, and, I, and I had no idea what I was looking for. I just wanted to see what did people do in the past when they had bacterial infections. And again, one day I had an aha moment. It turns out, when I actually went for my health checkup, uh, the guy drew some blood and I asked the lab technician, you know, uh, how do you know that you know, what I have is a bacterial infection? He said, well, we take the culture, we put it in a Petri dish, and then we put some food in the Petri dish, and then we see what grows. And in your case, what is growing is this particular bacteria called Staph aureus. And then I thought, wait, so what is that food that makes the, the bacteria grow that you use on your, on your, on your dish? And he said, uh, actually, we use iron. And I thought, hmm, this is interesting. And something clicked in my mind because just a few days earlier I had been reading in the library about how independently all civilizations had developed bloodletting as a cure for bacterial illnesses. I, at that time, of course, people didn't know what bacteria were. This was before the age of microbiology. But every single civilization from the Egyptians to the Romans to the Indians to the Chinese independently have developed bloodletting. So if you, you know, in the old days, if you had an infection, if you were ill, what they would do, the first thing they would do is they would just take out a pint of blood. And the worst case, it didn't do any harm, but in, in a lot of cases, if you did actually have a bacterial infection, this thing tended to clear up. And I thought, you know, why would people do that and why would people independently discover it? Well, it turns out, well, of course, blood is full of iron and Staph aureus feeds on iron. Now, most of us have different levels of iron in our body and, and of course, anemia is a debilitating illness. Some two billion people have anemia. But there is also there's something on the other side. There are some people who have too much iron and not uh, you know, excessive amounts of iron, but just enough that you end up getting bacterial infections. So what I realized is that in my case, because of my diet, I'm from India and I was living in the West, I had ended up with just enough iron at the high end of the range that it was coming out in the form of bacterial infections. So from, all I had to do was just the simplest cure. I went to the blood donation center, gave a pint of blood, and in you know, 22 years, I haven't had uh, a bacterial infection. So it's been a complete cure. All right. Thank you. So it really gave me thought that, you know, science and medicine are evolving all the time. And it doesn't take, uh, you know, a super expert with a PhD to, to talk about, uh, uh, you know, about health. What you really have to do is try and connect the dots across different disciplines. There is a lot of knowledge that people were using in the past uh, and th there is a huge amount of scientific advances. And so I decided to combine those two and, and that's how All About Bacteria was born. So here is something uh, that I want to share with you about what you know, the, the latest advances in science. Because medicine is typically a decade behind advances in science and in microbiology. So this is what, see, uh, what we see in classically in textbooks about what the human body is. We've all seen a picture like this. But if you think about it from a microbiologist perspective, this is the human body. We are made up of 100 trillion cells, 90% of which are bacterial cells, and only 10% are human cells. So you are actually a walking pond, 65% water with 100 trillion cells, a bacterial living ecosystem. Now think about that next time you use a household disinfectant. Taking antibiotics frivolously is like pouring poison into the pond you will change the ecological balance with extremely unpredictable results. And I'll show you a little bit about what are those results, uh, uh, what are those potential results. Now, if you're dying of bacterial infection, of course, you have to take antibiotics. You know, uh, this is not, uh, I'm not against antibiotics. I'm against the 90 odd percent of antibiotic prescriptions that are uh, written frivolously. This is a fact that is astonishing and just from a few months ago, and it shows you how little we know about microbiology. Scientists sampled 60 people at random and they found 2,368 species of bacteria in their belly buttons. You, at the moment, in your belly button, 
have more unique individual species of bacteria than, are, than there are species of birds in India. And that's just your belly button. Between your forearm and your elbow, they have so far discovered 450 species of bacteria. And your body is literally like the Amazon rainforest. Right? We talk about saving the rainforest. Why don't we save our own bodies? So the maximum amount of antibiotic misuse happens, unfortunately, in this country. Because we go to the doctor and we have an expectation that they have to give us a prescription. You know, if they tell you, oh, you have the flu, you don't need anything, it, you don't feel like you got your money's worth. So you say, no, 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 just give me an antibiotic prescription. I'm going to go and take something. And you feel better anyway three days later. But 10 days later, you have acid reflux and you don't know why. More than 90% of antibiotic prescriptions are totally unnecessary. You know, luckily still in this country, we don't feed antibiotics as much to animals. If you look at the US, the problem is even worse. 90% of the antibiotics consumed in the US are fed to animals to fatten them up. And one more thing, using household disinfectants is just plain bullshit. It's not required. Just clean it. Soap and water is good enough. These are just some of the illnesses that are caused by antibiotic misuse. Clostridium, which is a deadly, deadly infection. Vitamin B and D deficiency. You know, if I asked you, actually, can we have a, qu a quick show of hands? Anyone dis diagnosed with vitamin B or D deficiency in this audience? Uh, there's a few. Uh, I see that this is a huge problem in India now. People are going to the doctor and they see that uh, uh, they're vitamin deficient. That's because these vitamins are made by bacteria in your gut. You take an antibiotic and, you, you know, you get rid of that particular colony, then you'll end up with a vitamin deficiency. Acid reflux, obesity, gastritis, celiac disease, eczema, all of these things are potentially you know, caused by bacteria or changing the composition of bacteria in your gut. So now think of the human body in this way. You act, your body's immune system is one, your body's bacterial ecosystem is on the other, and they're both on a, on a finely balanced seesaw regulated by the amount of iron in your body. Neither one is better than the other. They both need to be finely balanced, and that's what is a health balance. If you think about what are the causes of death today, and this is a, these are US statistics, in 1900, 40% of people used to die from bacterial illness, and only about 14% from immune. If you look at it now, only 4% of people die from bacterial illnesses. 64% of deaths are caused by immune diseases, like heart disease, lung disease, diabetes. These are all immune illnesses. So why are we still fighting the war from 100 years ago and, and fighting bacteria? Are you still taking supplements that boost your immune system? If, you, if they actually work, you know, luckily for us, those supplements don't work. If they actually boosted your immune system, you'd probably die of heart disease because you know, heart disease is an immune illness. Now, there are four properties of bacteria, and I'll go through this fairly quickly. Bacteria, of course, they reproduce, and they reproduce at an astonishing rate. Right? They double typically in your body at every 17 minutes. Uh, and uh, uh, and you, know, you would end up with a massive overgrowth of bacteria. It's like, it's like how bread is made. You know, and, and we know how quickly yeast double and they make bread. It, it's the same way bacteria reproduce at a very astonishing rate. They also exchange DNA. This is why good bacteria can become pathogenic, because they, they are passing virus or another bacteria gives it an a, a, a evil you know, DNA. The third thing is a very interesting characteristic. Bacteria have the ability to sense how many of their own species there are in a given ecosystem. And what's amazing is, if they are held in check, if their number doesn't rise above what we call the quorum sensing threshold, they're not dangerous. Even the most dangerous bacteria in your body, unless they cross a certain threshold in terms of their numbers, they don't start doing the fourth thing, which is producing a toxin or a vitamin or whatever it is that they do. So there are many ways you can keep bacteria in check in the body, but the best, the single best way of doing it is by maintaining a healthy ecological balance where all the thousands of species of bacteria are held in check by each other. That is really the best way. That is how a pond ecosystem works and that is how our human ecosystem also works. So here are some new treatments that, that, that we can think of by using some of the information that we've learned in the last few years. The first thing is, you know how in Indian villages, people plaster their homes and floors with cow dung? There is a reason for this. Cow dung is 25% bacteria, but these bacteria are, are a form of E. coli that are completely harmless to humans. So what happens is that this dung acts as a disinfectant because it actually prevents pathogens by swamping the whole area with friendly bacteria. So now think of operating theaters, 
right? The reason we have these super bugs evolving is that you're trying to keep operating theaters sterile. Sterile doesn't work in nature because nature is full of bacteria. But what if we had some kind of a sanitized cow dung which would be sprayed in operating theaters, which would prevent pathogens uh, from just because you know, uh, you know, the, the, uh, it's friendly bacteria that's preventing the pathogens from taking root. So in this sense, you know, I mentioned earlier that household disinfectants are bullshit, but it actually turns out that bullshit is actually the best disinfectant. Now, here is the, this is my favorite part, right, probiotics. Uh, so because I'm against frivolous antibiotics, people ask me, are you for probiotics? I said, sure, I'm for probiotics. Now, here's the problem. When you take probiotics, they, it has to go through your stomach acid, and stomach acid is extremely powerful. Uh, the other problem is that probiotics are, are typically just one species. You know, when you have thousands of species living in your gut, what is the point of taking one species of uh, friendly bacteria, right? And the, the real issue is that it's, it's a big marketing story. You know, we can take, uh, we can go and buy all these things in the, in the store and we can take it. It's harmless. Probiotics are pretty harmless because they have friendly bacteria, but they don't, they don't have a huge benefit because of the method of delivery. If you're really serious about probiotics, there is another way of taking probiotics, which doesn't involve stomach acid. And that is you take it as an enema. Uh, and in fact, in the next decade, my prediction is that enema treatments will become hugely popular. And uh, in, there are some uh, life-threatening illnesses like Clostridium, which are being solved by taking fecal enemas from close relatives and giving, uh, and giving it to patients who are dying of Clostridium. And I think what we will see in the next decade is that kind of treatments will become very popular because it's natural. It's replacing a diseased bacterial ecosystem in your gut with a healthy bacterial ecosystem from a close relative or from some other family member. And uh, this has a huge amount of potential in, in medicine today. Thank you very much. So Ravi, we have a few uh, doctors in the audience. Do you have any comments for them? Well, you know, I tell people, uh, you know, I think doctors absolutely save lives. Right? There's no question about it. If you're sick, go see a doctor. Don't come talk to me. I'm, you know, what, what I'm talking about is, uh, is prevention. What I'm talking about is how do we uh, take the latest advances in microbiology and incorporate it into medicine that's already practiced well by, 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 that, by, by doctors. That's wonderful. But, you know, how do you change these hats easily? I understand that you're also working on a weight loss program and uh, you've been invited by celebrities in Hollywood uh, to come and work with them for weight loss. So, can you tell how do you balance all these things? You know, the, the bacterial part actually was, uh, for me, that, that's the first step of a, of a journey. You know, I'm kind of looking at the human body and thinking, you know, what is the ideal way of uh, treating the human body? And we're all different, so we all have different body types, and uh, so things work differently for individuals. And that's part of the, the journey is to understand the differences. Um, in India, if you ask me, the single biggest problem is the amount of sugar we consume. And I'm not just talking about sweet sugar, I'm talking about non-sweet sugar, which is rice. Rice, pasta, wheat, idlis, these things are absolutely causing a massive diabetes ep epidemic in India. And, and, you know, and that's something, it's not directly related to bacteria, but that's the crusade that I'm on is, you know, if we have to stop and reverse diabetes in India, we have to really cut down on the amount of sugar. Uh, particularly rice sugar that we consume. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming all the way from Singapore. And uh, I'm sure a lot of people will appreciate your venture into medicine and all this stuff in the future. Thank you so I hope much. so. And uh, his book, All About Bacteria, is in the goodie bag for everybody. So thank you for that. <laughs>